Hello everyone and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and I'll be your host as we answer all those gardening questions. We love to get those pictures and questions from you, our loyal viewers. So if you'd like to send us a note, send that email to byf at unl.edu for a future show. We do need to know as much as you can tell us about that question and do include where you live. That does make a difference. We can't get to all those questions on air. You can still search for answers on our social media sites, YouTube for past shows, and our followers on Facebook. We always like to get the show started with samples and that's there's no insect involved, or am I wrong? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So what I brought, this is a winter killed uh, piece of rose bush from beside my house. This actually would have died a couple of years ago or a little more, as you can tell by the wear and the bark coming off. Uh, but what some of these things do when you leave them around is we get holes in them that are excavated. Let's see if they can get, this is the one that the mud cap has been broken. Let's see here, and get it just right. It might be kind of hard for the audience to see in there without the light shining in, but this one has had the mud cap broken. So this is an older uh, solitary bee nest, most likely a mason bee. And then in the longer cane, this one hasn't had the mud cap broken yet. So this one was likely made last year. And some of the things I've been hearing about uh, leaving your plant parts out for pollinators to nest in is if you're looking at cleaning up from last year's garden, anything that would have been green and killed off by that hard freeze of the fall, the first one, likely is not gonna have a bee or solitary bee nest in it. Uh, so any of that stuff you can go ahead and clean off, or if you're really brave, you can leave it for this summer for them to nest in. So that would be uh, the suggestion. And Kim, would you like a solitary bee for your yard? I would actually, <laughs> just one. <laughs> well, there actually is probably several of them all the way up and down the stem. There can be yeah. uh, five, six or more chambers in there each with, very cool. with a bee in it. Yeah. I mean, it is a solitary bee. It is a solitary bee. So it's a solitary bee. mother is the way it works out. It's a solitary <laughs> mother. Most mothers are actually, aren't they? <laughs> In the animal kingdom, yes, it <laughs> tends to work out that way. All right, thanks, Wayne. All right, Dennis, a, a, a critter. Yeah, so I brought a 13-line ground squirrel found across pretty much the whole state. They like very groomed grass, and they dig two holes, oh, about two to three inches in diameter, no dirt around them, and that goes down and back up 20 feet later, and down in there they have a chamber about the size of a football. Um, and they like different types of seed material, so they'll eat things like, uh, oh, corn. If you just plant a corn, they'll go right down the row and eat it. Um, they also will eat dandelions and other flowers. Um, they're not much of a problem with their digging because, again, solitary holes. They do go up gutters lots of times to hide, and so sometimes dogs and cats go after them. Um, that's a full-size one. So to get rid of them, you can just use one of these special cages. You put over the hole, as you can see, there's a one-way door. You just pour water down the hole. If you have two of these, you find the other hole, do the same thing. They come up, and then they're trapped on this side of the cage. And then what? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't relocate to your friend's house, right? This one is not under the translocation regulations, but... But you can move them out of your yard and just move them over less than 100 yards away and let them go. Okay, all right. Nice recovery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, John, what did you bring today? Well, I didn't realize that solitary was the, the, the word of the day because both of them used it. So I'm going to have to work it in when I talk about my, my sample as well. So looks kind of weird for a garden, but this is actually, um, if you're wanting to grow some uh, oh. plants, it's a garden bag. So it's basically a pot. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're wanting to grow vegetables and you don't have a garden space or you need extra space, you can use something like this, very lightweight. You just fill it with potting soil, some good soil. See, it popped right out there. Uh, the benefit of this is that if I were, this is a 10 gallon pot. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to go buy a plastic 10 gallon pot, uh, even a, a basic one would be, you know, five, eight, ten dollars. I probably got this one for about three or four dollars. So I bought them in a five pack. Uh, also, it's handy for things like uh, what I'm using these for this year is growing potatoes and sweet potatoes. So I'll plant them in there, uh, and then at the end of the season when I'm ready to harvest, all I do is pick it up and dump it out 
I don't have to go digging all my potatoes and sweet potatoes out. Uh, so that's handy. So you can plant, you know, a few, you know, a, you know, almost any crop in here, like a solitary tomato uh, or <laughs> uh, a, a solitary potato, a tomato, um, or, you know, a, a few, like a handful of beans or a cucumber, a solitary cucumber. There we go. We'll work that in there. Uh, and so uh, you can find those in garden centers online uh, and they're pretty handy. You can get them this size, you can get them smaller. And actually I've seen them that you can get if you don't want to do a raised bed, you can get like a three by six version of this. You just plop down on the ground or on concrete and fill it with potting soil and you have an instant raised bed. And, and they drain, right? Isn't they drain, the, it's perfect, fabric it's fabric. Material. So it's basically yeah. like a thick version of landscape fabric. Right. Uh, and so drainage included. I know, I think we tried them one, one year, the very first year they came out in the backyard farmer garden. And we had abysmal, uh, but it, they, were, they weren't that good fabric, they were some other strange. Yeah, they've, they've definitely evolved yeah. over time. Yeah, cool, excellent, thank you, John. All right, we're gonna go ahead and start with questions for you, Wayne, first picture questions. Um, this is, um, this, this uh, is a Lincoln viewer founded along Stevens Creek off the Murdoch Trail, so in kind of that wooded area. Thought it was an elm of some sort. Uh, Notice the pink things. What are the things? Well, it is an elm, and sometimes, uh, these are galls on the elm leaves, and you'll sometimes hear these galls referred to as slippery elm galls because they typically like to occur on red elm, which another colloquial name for red elm is slippery elm and this is actually caused by an aphid. So there's an aphid in there and then it causes that abnormal growth on the leaf and causes that gall. So the, the more technical name for these would be a, a sack gall or a pouch gall. Harmful or just unusual? Most galls are not detrimental to the plant. They just cause some oddball things to happen. And, and wig people uh, out. The one, the one interesting thing about this is this is an advent of aphid. It's from Europe actually. So it's not a native aphid species that does this. All right, thank you. Uh, your second one here is also a Lincoln viewer. Discovered zillions of eggs in and near the flowers of her viburnum. Uh, this is actually one of the arrowwood viburnums. And she says there's ants feeding and about 50% of the flowers had these eggs with small somethings. She did drench it with uh, uh, an oil She's never, I, she's never had this happen before. So what is this and is there a prognosis on this well, one? Well, they're not eggs, mm -hmm. that's for certain. Uh, they're one of the many species of aphids that will hit viburnums. There's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. We manage them all the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, but those ants are visiting and collecting the honeydew. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the extra water and sugar that the aphids excrete after trying to get through and get more of the harder to get nutrients out of the plant and really the hose works really good on aphids. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, insecticidal soaps work really well as um, horticultural oils don't work real well for aphids in this stage. If they're in the overwintering egg stage, yes, they can work, they can smother that egg. Uh, but at this point, these aphids are reproducing asexually, so they're just poppy, popping out carbon copies of themselves. All right, excellent. So she's likely to ha continue to have the problem if she doesn't take care of it. Yeah, All right. very much so. All right, and your third one, uh, we actually have had this a couple times uh, this year already, but this is, this is a current one, which is uh, a weeping white pine and it, about 12 years old. Never seen this on it before. He's calling it kind of a mildew. What is it and is it to be worried about? This is pine bark adelgid, mm -hmm. and they can get a little out of hand and cause problems. Uh, you can control them uh, with dormant oils before the growing season starts. The only problem with that is it does cause issues with the needles mm -hmm. if you use a dormant oil on that. Uh, however, insecticidal soaps do work very well for adelgids. There's no resistance at this point in them. So, so be a it's good not option. too late to go ahead and... No, or the hose. Or I, the hose. You know, I, you, these you small, like the hose. Those, I do like using the hose to clean <laughs> out a lot of these soft-bodied small insects because it damages them enough they can't crawl back up on the plant. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to worry about whether your kids or pets or anybody else gets into it mm -hmm. after you've done something. And there's great satisfaction with that nozzle in yeah, your Yeah, there's hand. just a little bit of sadistic joy that comes from <laughs> spraying I mean, I was, them off. I was wondering, it's like Wayne is at home and he's like, 
you know, it leaves the plant alone or it gets the hose, right? <laughs> <laughs> you do the same thing for your kids? <laughs> Once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> when it's warm enough. All right, Dennis, uh, this is a St. Paul viewer. Found this critter in the egress window. Um, there was some mowing of va vacant lots. They did, I think we have two pictures here, and the critter did exit, climbed, uh, yeah. climbed up the two by fours. Wonder what this is. It's a woodchuck, a groundhog, and he has a lot of gall to be down in there. Mm -hmm. um, but what happens is when they're excited of being chased, they'll go to a, an object like a house and they'll run along it, mm -hmm. and it'll just drop down in that pitfall. Mm -hmm. And so if you have an egress window like this, I would suggest putting a cover on it because mm -hmm. you'll get other things in there. You get cats, you can get snakes, you can get voles and moles mm -hmm. falling in those. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always good to put one of those plastic covers on those that you can just pop up real easily if you have to egress out. But it's woodchuck or groundhog. All right, excellent. Uh, your next one is a Grand Island viewer. Uh, wondering what this is, um, and yeah. they think it's a bird. And yeah, it is it's a, a bird. bird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yes. Being a good herpetologist, it's a bird, so it's just a reptile gone bad, phylogenically. Um, I think, and I don't know for sure, so if you're an ornithologist, please you know, <laughs> correct me uh, via email. I think it may be, it looks like a rail, but it could be what's called an upland um, sandpiper. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I would go with just off the top of my head, uh, an upland sandpiper. Pretty cool. Yeah, really. they are cool. I've not seen one of those. All right, your turn, uh, John. This is a Hornick, Iowa viewer, which is Northwest Iowa. Um, and in fact, you have several of these rhubarb questions. This is Victoria. She wonders, uh, is, should she cut the seeds off or, and is it okay to leave the stalks? So you should just cut that all the way to the base. So rhubarb will do this if it's sort of unhappy or if it gets really mature. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you don't dig it up and divide it every three to five years, or if the weather is really hot, really dry, or if the soil nutrients are off, it will send up blooms. It's sort of like, hey, I'm you know ready to go out and see the world. This place is you know not the best for me mm -hmm. uh, kind of thing. Uh, and so just cut those off at the base uh, and it will let the plant grow out. All right, uh, your second one is a Millard viewer. Um, and this is the first year since they planted this rhubarb, she wonders why the leaves are yellowing. She had not watered it. This was actually came in only uh, on Monday, so. Yeah, and I think the, the key here is not watered, um, especially a newer plant. So it was planted last year, so it has some established roots, mm -hmm. but probably not great. And you're probably a little low on the water if you haven't watering, especially if we, you know, we had like a drier, warmer period before mm -hmm. this past week when, you know, at least in Omaha, it's rained every day uh, mm -hmm. this week. Um, but so that looks sort of just like um, what would happen if it wasn't watered. All right, and your third one is also rhubarb, but this is Columbus. Uh, successfully transplanted this spring and then saw this. Says uh, the transplant is a little stunted, but also seems to be coming along. What's this? So that is the, the immature version of what we saw in the first picture. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that is that flower bud that is getting ready to form. So just pull those off and you'll be good to go. Excellent. Well, planting in the ground is always a good way to get a garden going, but maybe a better way is to have some of those raised beds around your garden area. They give you the option of starting sooner, ending later, and you can control what goes in them a little easier than in conventional gardens. Here's Terry James to tell us more. Two thousand twenty saw a ton of new gardeners, almost sixteen million across the United States. One of the things that we like to do on Backyard Farmer is help you succeed at gardening and give you the best advice possible with that science base. One of the things that we really like to see when new people start gardening is the success that they have. One way to succeed in gardening is to actually install raised beds. Raised beds can be pretty much anything that's gonna lift the soil up. You can have wood, you can have stone, you can have huge containers, like a used galvanized water tub that you had used for your animals. So really anything will work. As you can see here, I have two different examples. This is my own backyard. 
I am replacing the old ones with some new ones. I'm using a mix of wood and galvanized roof shingles to kind of help extend the life of my, of my wood. One of the other things that benefits raised beds is that your growing season extends. You can install some hoops and some plastic. You can make some mini low tunnels on your beds, which will extend the growing season both earlier in the spring and later in the fall. Put those greens in the bed in March and you'll have radishes and, and lettuces well earlier than anybody else. Or you can extend it further into the fall and have fresh lettuce on your Thanksgiving table. There are lots of different ways to build these. As you can see, this one is built just by using four by fours and two by sixes and the galvanized. You can control the soil. The best kind of mix for raised beds is about a 60-40 mix of compost to topsoil. So raised beds are a way that you can succeed at gardening. So try a raised bed, whether you buy a kit, you build it from scratch, or use something that you have already on hand. Raised beds will definitely help you succeed in your gardening. And of course, those raised beds might also be a good option if you don't have enough space to put in a full garden or you have creatures or children that are going to run through your full garden. <laughs> All right, Wayne, your next set of pictures. Um, this is an Oxford, Nebraska viewer and simply wants to know whether this is a good guy or a bad guy. It was uh, in the house by the houseplants. This is a bold jumper. It's a jumping spider. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the good guys. Um, mm -hmm. There's only one species of spider in the world that's been found to feed on plants. The rest of them are predatory. So whatever else so is creeping and crawling around in his house would be lunch. Food for it, something they like, flies, small flying things that they can catch on the side of buildings. Uh, this particular one is female, and I can tell that because of the three orange dots mm -hmm. on, the, on the abdomen. The males are uh, much more brightly adorned in orange or white. Uh, those dots can also be white, so that's how I can tell the difference. All right. Between male and female on that one. A bold jumping spider. Yes. All right. Your next picture is um, this is a bay tree. So it's a so it's a house plant. He was just moving it outdoors for the season. He found this on it. He does store this big pot inside through the winter. What is that? So this one's kind of interesting. At first glance, I would almost think this is a spider egg sac, mm -hmm. but when you look at it, it has this t almost tail-like mm -hmm. piece to it. And then you can see the silk on it, it's tied off, it almost looks like something made of tent. It almost makes me wonder if this wasn't a caterpillar that had a failed attempt at pupation. Hmm. And then that's, that's what's left. Uh, it's, it's conjecture at this point what it really is. Um, it doesn't look right. Um, I almost thought it was a seed case of a shrub or something first and then yeah, but it's got all that something. silk on there right. and that yeah so that really leaves us with either a caterpillar that failed in pupation or maybe mm -hmm. a spider egg case mm -hmm. uh, but we typically don't see spider egg cases with that kind of a tail coming off so mm -hmm. I'm almost wondering if that wasn't the head end mm -hmm. where the the bulb is and then that tail end is the rest of the body that just shriveled up. Give it a slice and dice and let us see the picture of what's inside. That might be the best way to help out <laughs> with this, and just to see what that looks like. All right, your next one is a, um, she says, please identify this pretty insect, and she is in Jeff County near Gladstone, Nebraska. This is a tiger moth. Uh, they belong in the genus Apotensis, and it used to be in Gramia, but there's a lot of them that look very similar and the only way you can tell them apart is by dissecting out the male genitalia. So uh, at this point, I would say just in, enjoy the, the beauty of the moth and let it go. They're typically not a pest species. Excellent, thank you very much. All right, Dennis, um, this first one is a weed patch off the backyard down over the bank of a creek. Found these, these holes, they're about eight to 10 inches across. I think we have two pictures on this one. Uh, two very close together and then about 15 feet straight on down the bank. There are two more like this very close together. Mm -hmm. They wonder, uh, is it a groundhog? And whatever it is, they want to get rid of it. Well, it looks like you have two things there because the, the hole is fan-shaped and you have that hole that's plugged. 
So that's telling me Plains Pocket Gopher. Mm -hmm. But things like um, badgers and coyotes and fox love to eat Plains Pocket Gophers. So I think you have a Plains Pocket Gopher building these big fan-shaped mounds and plugging the holes, and then you have a predator coming in on the side of each, digging in to eat that gopher. <laughs> okay, nature. So nature may take care of itself. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I would mainly, if it persists, um, there is a poisoned grain or pellet you can buy uh, commercially for putting into main runs. You can't put it in the surface. You have to find the main run for the pocket gopher. All and right. I would go with that route if it, be, if it continues to put more mounds in. All right. Your next one is actually a Stromsburg viewer. And uh, she is, and we have two pictures on this one too. She's wondering uh, if these are from a badger. She's had a, almost a dozen of these holes in the yard over the last 10 days. And she's wondering how to get it to stop. This is kind of a repeat because the first picture definitely looked like Plains Pocket Gopher mounds in a row. Mm -hmm. And then so this looks like right here, something digging for it, but it doesn't look badger-like. Badger, you can see the claws on the side. Mm -hmm. So this probably looks more like a canid. Mm -hmm. So uh, either a domesticated dog, a coyote, or a fox. Probably not a fox, because fox don't like to go after something as big as a Plains Pocket Gopher. They're kind of hard to dig for by mm -hmm. a fox, so maybe a coyote or a domesticated dog will do that easily. All right, excellent. Okay, John, I missed one of your pictures last time around. My bad, so you get it. And this is a Bennington viewer, has tomatoes and peppers uh, that he plants every year. Uh, unusual thing happened. They, he covered them for the frost, so he eliminated the frost issue. He's wondering, did they sit inside too long because they're so spindly, or is this frost damage? What do, what do we think here? Well, the spindliness could be that they were inside too long or didn't have enough light while they were inside. You could still, you know, have some sort of cool damage. Even, you know, we had those cool nights and you could have covered then, but some other nights were cool enough to do some damage. I've seen pictures come in of other things that have been damaged, even when you don't think, like the forecast doesn't say it's cold enough to frost, but it just gets low enough in your general area. Or it could be, uh, we see the damage is sort of like this whitish, tannish color. So that could either be frost or it could be that you didn't get them hardened off quite enough. And that could actually be sun scald. You put them out from an indoor where it's low light, outdoor where it's high light, and they can't take all that light and you can get some damage there. Okay, so just a, a wait and see. That's just a wait and see. All right, your next one, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a Battle Creek viewer. Wonders how much frost peonies can handle. Uh, frost, it was about 29 degrees or so. He did cover the plants. They're on the south, southwest side of the house. He's just kind of curious about this. So for the plant part, you know, that comes up early spring, even before we finish with frost. So the actual plant part can withstand, you know, pretty good cool temperatures. Uh, as you get to the blooms, they're a little more tender. Uh, and so, you know, if we get those really <coughs> cold freezing temperatures, uh, you might get some damage on the actual flowers, but the plants themselves, they will do per usually pretty fine through, you know, unless it gets really, really cold uh, mm -hmm. after they've come up. All right, uh, and then you have a couple pictures here that are a papillion viewer, and this is uh, seven peonies that were planted last fall. Excuse me. <clears throat> Three of them sprouted, as did some of the older ones. The other four have shown no signs of life. Any ideas on this? So it could be, um, you know, that they just didn't transplant well or plant well, you know, could have been planting too deep or it got too dry. Uh, and so there are lots of reasons why they wouldn't have come up. Um, you know, I would have suspected, uh, unless Kim has any more peony insight than I do, uh, <laughs> that, you know, they should have probably already came up yeah. if they were going to. I don't think there's any like late varieties that, you know, you should hold, hold out hope for. I think they just didn't make it. Right, and you know, he, he, he did say they planted them in the fall. Is that early fall, is that late fall? Did they, did right. they have Right, is a that chance? early fall, is that late fall? Or even if they bought them out the store, right. you know, and you get those bare root plants, like I've gotten some stuff that I know is dead when I get it, so. Right. Yeah, it's just too dead. <laughs> yeah. All right, and your final one here uh, has nothing to do with peonies, but <laughs> this is a Stella cherry, this is in Seward. 
Uh, it's 25 feet tall. They'd like to take that top out of it, and uh, they want to know whether they can do that on this. So the question is, are you growing this as a landscape tree, or are you growing this as a fruit production tree? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we see those top branches. They don't look filled out. Um, and you know, you could prune those back. If you're going straight for fruit production, what you actually might want to do is to prune that down to where you don't have a main, those main trunks going up, but you actually have more of a bowl shape where you would have like four or five trunks coming up. Uh, and that's the way we do a lot of those fruit production trees like peaches, like the stone fruits, peaches, cherries, etc. So typically we tell you never to top a tree, like never top a tree in your landscape. They don't like it, they get right. mad. Right. Uh, but fruit trees like uh, peaches and cherries, you can and create that bowl shape that will make it easier to harvest. Right. And that was sort of odd to see that top. It yeah, almost that was, looks like it's, it's not doesn't happy. belong. Yeah. Right, exactly. Well, last week we saw our plants in the greenhouse going outside for the final preparation for planting. They're still getting used to being out there Terry says they'll be in the ground soon out at the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, the day has finally arrived. We've been talking about getting our plants out of the greenhouse for several weeks now. The weather just hasn't been cooperative, but we are finally out. We are hardening those plants off and they are looking really good with these cool, cloudy days to get them ready to put them out in our garden to plant. So we're very excited about that next step in getting our garden created for the 2021 season. We did get some of our containers started. As you can see, we have a really good start with some of the cuttings that we'd taken from last year. So some of those bigger plants really give an instant impact into those containers. Our cool season plants are looking really good. We have some onions up. Uh, we've had a couple harvests of radishes already. So some great salads ready to go out of our cool season plants in our raised beds. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. Right now it is time for the lightning round. John, are you ready? Always. This, uh, this particular viewer wants to know whether the bulb foliage of her tulips and daffodils can be cut back now, or does she really have to wait until it turns yellow? You should really wait until it turns yellow so you can have energy back into the bulb and have better blooms next year. All right, um, this is a viewer from the eastern side of the state who wonders, is there anything he can do to keep the broccoli from flowering if it gets hot this weekend? He doesn't wanna pick all of it yet. Um, not really. Uh, you can try shade cloth or uh, do what I do, plant it in the fall. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is a Springfield viewer who wants to know a good vegetable to plant now that her kohlrabi has been harvested. So anything, any of the warm season stuff like tomato, pepper that can go right in, that's the beauty of uh, that rotational cropping there. All right, this is a Clarkson viewer who has uh, new seedling asparagus coming up in the crowns of the older asparagus. She wonders how to get rid of the new seedlings without damaging the crowns because she thinks that's probably not a good thing. You can probably just pop them up. They're actually coming from seed, so they don't have much of a root. All right, uh, is it time to move peonies now? This person has to move. I mean, it's not the best time, but go ahead if you're moving, take some with you. All right, excellent. Nice job. Dennis, you ready? Is a frog's butt semi permeable? <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question, but I'll assume it is because it's, you asked it. Yeah, it's not watertight, it's semi permeable. <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right. On that note, your very first question is from a papillion viewer. Uh, she wants to know where to put a bat house, and the idea is to put the bats in that house instead of in their house. On a building or pole, not on a tree, about 12 foot up, facing south. Facing south, all right. This is a, this is a viewer in Blair. The neighbor feeds corn to the birds and the squirrels, and uh, the neighbor is wondering, does that keep them from eating other things? Not necessarily. Um, they'll eat what's available, and so what's ever available, they'll eat, so. All right, this is a Falls City viewer who wants to know how to keep the squirrels away from the, their container plants. Does hot sauce work or what works? Uh, you can use hot sauce and vegetable oil or you can put like uh, chicken wire over it and have the plants grow up between the chicken wire and then they can't dig in it. 
All right. Uh, this viewer wants to know how to keep the raccoons out of his sweet corn. He's using a four foot tall fence with mesh. One line of electric fence with peanut butter. All right. A Bellevue viewer has squirrels eating the paint off the bottom of their garage doors. That is marking. Use the vegetable oil and hot pepper. Nice. All right. Good job. All kinds of good recipes in there. My squirrel recipe doesn't have hot sauce. So I have to share <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, I like my, my squirrel spicy. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne, you're going to have to stop laughing. <laughs> it's going to be tough. Good night. All right. Uh, this is a viewer who uh, we've talked about carpenter bees, and uh, she's wondering if would they use a bee house or a bee hotel instead of drilling into the deck or the soffits? If you're having trouble on the deck and soffits, get it treated and coated with paint or some other stain they typically don't like. Okay. Excavating in that, that would be the best deterrent. So they're not going to use the bee house? I've not heard of them using one. All right. This is a viewer uh, who has little beetles that look like black and white ladybugs. They showed up inside the house. He wonders what they are. The, we couldn't use the picture because it wasn't quite clear enough. If they're elongated and they have a black on each end with kind of a white crosswise stripe in the middle, my guess is they're probably carpet beetles. Okay. This is a Raven Oaks. Uh, Omaha viewer who is saying it's a bumper tick crop this year. Do they have a season or do they rule until it freezes? Uh, we typically see them heavy this time of year and every year everybody thinks it's the worst year ever. All right. Uh, this is a viewer who says is the summer buzzing cicadas or something else? This isn't supposed to be a cicada year. Not here. So the big issue with that is we have brood X, which is brood 10 of the 17 year cicadas coming out. They are in the eastern part of the country. We will not see them here. Mm -hmm. I believe we are brood five mm -hmm. and we won't see them until, let's see if I get this right, 2032, I believe. So she's hearing Katie dids or something else. Other insects at this point. There's a few grasshoppers that overwinter as adults that you would hear now. Okay, excellent. All right, John, what do we have for the unruly plants of the week? Right, yeah, they're sort of just going <laughs> everywhere here. Uh, so we have a Baptisia here, and this is Twilight Prairie Blues Baptisia. Uh, it's a hybrid of our native Baptisia. Sometimes they're called native ours. Uh, and it's really cool. So it's this giant plant. It's almost shrub-like. It has these giant purple um, flower spikes that actually change color as they age. Um, it's great, uh, a long-lived long plant, uh, likes full sun to part shade, uh, and, um, you know, they, they were actually used by uh, Native Americans as baby rattles. The seed pods are really neat, and they, they will rattle when they're dry. Uh, and then this uh, yellow one here, this is Heartleaf Alexander. Uh, it's in the rain garden here, likes to be on those edges. Uh, has a nice glossy foliage. I don't know if I can, there we go. Uh, so there, see, heart leaf uh, right there, uh, and uh, will produce seedlings, but it's uh, not to excess. It's a, a native as well. Excellent, and those are both in our backyard farmer garden. So as always, we say visit early, visit often. Right. All right. Thank you, John. All right. Uh, Wayne, your next set of picture questions here. Uh, this is a viewer from Plattsmouth who wants to know what kind of a grub this is. It's the bigger one he's ever seen. Uh, he, it rolls onto its back to crawl and has big pinchers and he does, that's a hose washer next to it. <laughs> well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we can see bigger grubs than that in Nebraska. Oh, gee. Uh, this particular one uh, is likely a green June beetle because it mm -hmm. rolls over and moves on its back. That's kind of a characteristic of it. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a genus called Osmoderma that it's much bigger and they feed in dead rotting wood. So they're a recycler, they're beneficial, unlike these, which can be a real turf pest. Okay, all right, and then turn into a green June beetle. Mm -hmm. All right, your next one is a Lincoln viewer. That's a great picture. Uh, they, she wonders whether this is an iris borer. She found it munching on this iris bud uh, May 8th. She doesn't know, know how early they hatch or whether the cold temps would have killed them. Actually, we're a little early for iris borer and they don't bore in the buds. They start in the t tips of the leaves and work their way down into the tubers eventually. Mm -hmm. And they also tend to be brown to a slight pink and orange tint to them. Mm -hmm. So this obviously does not fit uh, that 
MO. Uh, as I looked at this, uh, first thing that went to my mind, boring in a flower like this, oh, is this a tobacco budworm? Mm -hmm. It is not, it does not have the right markings. Um, this one, I really needed a side shot mm -hmm. to go with the top shot, because uh, a lot of these um, small green moth caterpillars, you know, there's descriptive markings on the top, which you can see beautifully in this picture. This is great for the top, uh, but I can't see the side and there's some markings that go on the side. It reminds me of one of the sword grass moth caterpillars, but mm -hmm. I can't say for certain. I even went on to the International Moth uh, Lepidoptera Plant Host Database to see what we get on, on iris in North America, and nothing looks even close to that. Interesting. So I couldn't narrow it down that way. So she should just flick it off and call well, it. Well, at this point, since she's got it out, you know, right. two fingers could take care of that pretty easily, or brick A and brick B, okay. insert between and, and there probably aren't squish. More. Yeah, there probably aren't. More. No recipes with hot sauce? <laughs> Actually, you know, a little peanut oil lightly fried, a little salt. <laughs> Yuck. All right, yeah. your next picture is a two-year-old. Uh, it's a Liberty apple. It was bare root when it was planted. Uh, they spotted this insect boring into the trunk. They did get him out wondered what it is and should they worry about more? Okay, so this one, you have to zoom in really close on this and you'll actually see it's a black insect with two orange spots. It's a twice stabbed lady beetle. And it is in there on a wound that it did not cause. They are another predatory mm -hmm. um, insect. So this is one of the good guys. And I'm guessing it's already squished if they got it out of there. It was mm -hmm. probably just finding a place to hide. And they're what we call one of our arboreal lady beetle species, so they do prefer tree habitats. Twice stabbed. Yeah. You guys have the most interesting names. Okay, <laughs> Dennis, um, yes. this, is, this is your scat series. Oh, so <laughs> the first one here, uh, this is Grand Island. Um, she said this turned, and there's two pictures, and they're, they're two different ones, uh, yeah. on their deck railing. So she said nothing seemed to be disturbed on the deck. They have a half an acre lot. They, they have a lot of wild visitors and they do feed the birds. Yeah, it, it's, it's old and I don't have any scale next to it, like mm -hmm. measurement. I don't see any white cap on it, but if it got rained on, the white cap could, would come off, which means it would be avian. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm kind of hard pressed with this one. If I have to say anything, I'll say maybe turkey or goose or duck. Mm -hmm. that it got rained on. And, and was the first one the same thing? Or yeah, was it? Okay. yeah. All right, all righty. Your next one is Omaha. This is two pictures. This is urban Omaha, backyard fenced on three sides, mm -hmm. south facing hill, multiple droppings, uh, no dogs, neighbor's dogs don't come into the yard. And if it is a coyote, how do they discourage De Definitely it? not coyote. Um, it's something smaller than a coyote. Um, I can see with the scale here. Mm -hmm. I'm leaning more towards skunk or opossum. Okay. With this, one, especially with this one. So they can just clean it up, and the kids can still play under yeah, the tree. Yeah, bury it. Yeah. Bury. Yeah, sanitize and sanitize. don't step in it. Yeah. Don't step in it. Right. Okay. Or eat it. Or eat. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't even fry it. <laughs> <laughs> with hot sauce. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And your your final one here oh. is. <laughs> She has found all of these in the mulched area of her backyard. It doesn't look like a forensic. <laughs> um. she, she doesn't have pets. Uh, she doesn't have any sort of food source or nesting. Yeah, with it being that way, in that shape, I'm going with domesticated cat. A cat's jumping in that yard, because really? a cat can go up an eight foot fence. So right. and, and it may not, not be your cat, it's gonna be someone's cat. And, and just not burying, they're just. Yeah, well, it looks like it's kind of been tossed, but. Domesticated cats don't bury like wild cats lots of times, especially if they're not indoors. Mm -hmm. They'll just do it all in one area like that. Okay, so it's just a giant litter box. Yeah. Okay, all right. John. No pictures of poop, right? <laughs> no. For like, the CSI over here, like <laughs> yeah. Litter Scat Investigator, you know. SSI. <laughs> yeah. <That. laughs> So, so your first one is actually quite beautiful, uh, and it is, they, they simply want to know the name and how to care for it. It's on the north side of the house. Do we know what this is? 
Uh, this, <laughs> if my brain is functioning, uh, Brunera. Uh, and um, so this is a lovely shade plant uh, that you can, uh, you know, it, it's there. Uh, I think another term for it is bug loss. Mm -hmm. um, so an interesting plant. So those beautiful purple flowers. So enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And it uh, looks like that's one of the variegated ones. So, yes. Yeah, very nice. If it were a house plant and variegated, it'd be worth $1,000, but it's just a, a landscape <laughs> plant. Right. So. It's just a landscape <laughs> plant. <laughs> and they have it on the north side of the house, and that's what it would like. So yes. they've, mm -hmm. they've done well. All right. Um, you have uh, three pictures now, and this is uh, on an acreage north of Branched Oak here uh, in Lancaster County. Two different varieties of asparagus grown from seed. One's green, the other is a French purple. They've been in the ground six years. The French produces less stalks, but they're big, and the other produces green stalks that are very thin. So a couple of the plants on the green one have roots very near the top of the ground. She's wondering what she would, could do or should she do like a raised bed situation uh, so she can help add the soil on top of what these mounds are. How, do, how does she handle this to, to have it uh, produce well? Yeah, you don't want the roots on top of the ground, so I would try to get them deeper, either like just covering them. Uh, asparagus does really good in, in raised beds uh, as well, so you could do a raised bed a few inches high to, to plant them in there uh, and get them get them nice and, and happy. Uh, usually, uh, so the, the green, and I have the same, I have some green at home, they're not huge, and I have a purple one, and like, I don't even think you can eat it. Like, the, the stalks are like two inches wide, mm -hmm. um, and so... Um, Usually, if the stalks are too small, it means that, you know, it's over harvested usually. That may not be the case. So there's just something limiting to grow. So I would, you know, check that soil, um, maybe make sure they're not crowded too much, like mm -hmm. maybe dig them up and separate them uh, some uh, and, and enjoy. So just, just get them planted, get those roots covered, do a raised bed if you like. All right, excellent. Thank you, John. Well, millions of people took up gardening last year during the pandemic as a way to supplement their own food. We thought we'd take some time to offer a few simple tips throughout the season to help anybody who's new to the gardening world. So here is John Porter with some great tips for the novice gardener. Well, in 2020, we had almost 16 million new gardeners in the United States. Thanks to the pandemic and people wanting to grow fresh fruits and vegetables at home. So with all those new gardeners come lots of new problems and some new successes. And we saw that with people calling our office and online and plant discussion groups about all the different problems that people have in their garden. So what we're going to do is talk over the next few months about what are those potential issues that new gardeners face. And we're going to start off talking about planting and spacing and getting things just right to set us up for success. Now, first we're gonna talk about the spacing. Sometimes we get a little bit overzealous, perhaps, and plant too many things in too small of a space. For example, here I have a little raised bed cart here that I bought, I'm at my office here. And I wanna plant this, but I know that I can't fit a giant tomato plant in here and I can't fit giant peppers. So what I'm gonna do is plant things in here that are specifically made for containers. I know that I have enough space to plant those, so I have Patio Choice Yellow Tomatoes, and I have a Potapino, uh, and I have uh, a, um, an eggplant that is a miniature variety. All of these are All America Selections winners that we've trialed out in our garden. And so they're gonna be in here, and they're not gonna take up a lot of space. But if I'm out in a big garden, I might have more space and figuring out what can I plant and remembering to leave enough space around things like a tomato. You might see that little tiny tomato plant and say, oh, I have plenty of room for that, and I'm going to plant it a foot apart from something else, but it needs more space. You might need about two or three feet around that tomato plant to get a good space. So think about that and lay that out. Don't crowd your garden too close together because you're going to end up with a mess, and actually that is good fodder for diseases and insects to come into your garden. Number two is to know what you're planting and how it grows. Uh, we have people that may plant one tomato plant not realizing that it's an indeterminate tomato plant and it will keep growing and be nine foot tall if you let it go. Uh, and other people may not realize that one radish seed only turns into one radish. Maybe they were expecting a radish bush. And some of these things may sound weird, but if you've never gardened before, you may not understand how things grow. So do a little research to under understand how things grow and how much space 
uh, that they need. Another thing that we can think about is the timing. You know, we, we may have had people planting stuff a little early and we had a late winter uh, where temperatures stayed really cool in the evenings and damaged some stuff. Or people think if I don't plant it by the 1st of May, it's too late and I can't plant it. But there's a long planting calendar. Those cool season crops, they can be planted early in March and April in most places. And those warm season crops can actually be planted into the season. Still haven't planted your tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers and it's beginning of June. That's just fine. A lot of those things can be planted well into the season for a later harvest. And so you can actually space out that planting. You don't have to plant it all at once. You can space that out and get a harvest throughout the season and even sometimes avoid pests that are early in the season if you do that late planting. For example, tomatoes, you can probably plant those up until mid-June or even late June. Beans, you can do those late into the season for a fall crop. If they're a fast growing bean, you can actually plant them up until July and August for a fall crop. And then of course we have those cool season crops that you can plant again in August and September to get through the winter and have a beautiful crop. As you look past last year and this year and years in the future at your gardening successes and failures, you can figure out what went wrong and ask for help. Contact your local extension office to get the best scientific information on what will help you. You can also find us online. We have the First Steps to Vegetable Gardening website. We have the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel with all of our past episodes and also our Grow Big Red YouTube channel where we have lots of recorded sessions on question and answer and lots of those pressing issues for gardeners. Thanks to John and of course we'll have him come back later in the season with more of those great tips and techniques to help those new gardeners succeed. That, you know, that does put you in charge of the rain though, so. Well, true. You know, he knew his stuff, so it's all good. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> so your, uh, your next questions, Wayne. The first one here too are, um, these are petunias and hanging baskets. This is Hastings. What is going on? They really look like they're flea beetle damage to me. Okay. Um, in this case. Uh, you can use various things for them. One of the more eco-friendly ones, crushed seashells. Really? Yeah, they work great for beetles that feed on, on plants. Uh, so if you're looking for something more of the organic route, crushed seashell works real well because it uh, rips up the inside of their guts. Mm -hmm. And that's what made me famous years ago on my first show. I used that same mm -hmm. uh, thing for blister beetles. So it works well across, uh, otherwise, uh, you can use your classic things with carbaryl or permethrin work just as well right. too. And can you buy crushed seashells in a bag? Or do you have to go find them in Florida and put them back on the well, plane? You can go dig some of our native clams out if you really want to get your own. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. earth. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's not crushed seashells, but well, it's, close. it's close. It's close. <laughs> Very close. <laughs> it's All crushed right. coral. It's, it's a little um, finer typically than yeah. what yeah. the crushed seashell would be. All right, your next uh, two are uh, several of these shrubs on the east side of the house. These are hydrangeas. And she just noticed that one of them has curling leaves and they're kind of an odd color. They're about six years old. Do you think this is insect based? Hard to tell because so, she didn't send you one of them uncurled. Right, so there's, there's a number of things this could be. Uh, the first one, if we're gonna go insect based, is I would be checking the underside of those leaves and the curled leaves for aphids. When aphids feed on plants, they do a lot of wacky things in plants that cause folding leaves. We had the gall earlier mm -hmm. on, on tonight's show. Um, so that would be the first thing I would check for. Um, after that, it could be a disease, it could be environmental, it could be Something. herbicide, a little bit of light herbicide damage on that one particular or piece. It's just, it's tough without a little more digging deeper into it. Right, or a little more time and see what or happens. Or more time. Yeah. All right, thank you. I don't know if John, John was kind of looking like he wanted to bounce in there. Nope. No, it's a hydrangea. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not a tomato, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dennis, uh, now it's your, your snake and other creature <laughs> series. Uh, we don't know where this viewer was from, but she's wondering, uh, she thought it was looking for an entrance no, by the front door. No, it's just looking for a place to hide. It doesn't want to get in your house. No snake wants to get in your house. I can't even get him to get in my house, and I like him. Um, if I can see the back of the head, if I can see the top, I can see the side. 
just the opposite of wings. Um, so it's either fox snake or Great Plains rat snake. So if you're in a southern county, one of the two counties against Kansas, it's a Great Plains rat snake. If you're above that area, north of that area, it's a fox snake, both rat snakes, both the same genus, both completely harmless and they're rodent feeders. All right, uh, your next one is an Omaha viewer. Huh. Uh, saw this one on a hike at Walnut Creek. Yeah, bull snake, it'll shake its tail because all snakes shake their tail. Snakes do not imitate rattlesnakes. Only people are naive enough to think that. All right. um, but all snakes rattle their tails. The rattlesnake just develops something to make it better. All right, a bull snake. All right, and then we have a, um, a viewer who found these bones on a creek bed. They were sticking out from the lower wall of the creek. Um, the wall of the creek bed is about 10 feet high. She w and she did put a scale on there. Any? Yeah, those are big. Um, she thought it was a bison. No, I don't think they're big enough to, they're not long enough to be, that long bone should be longer for a bison. I'm thinking more like a pig, a good sized pig. A pig. Like, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know offhand. Okay. Um, a that's dead... only 16 inches. Right. A bison's going to be closer to 20 to 24 inches. So. Okay. I'm going with a big pig. Okay. <laughs> a lot of bacon. Yeah. All right. Okay, John, um, this is a silver maple. This is in Northwest Lincoln. Uh, there's a hole, obviously, very low in this tree. The hole's still the same. She wonders what they should do about the hole. Well, I wouldn't do anything to the hole. Uh, I would take a look at the tree. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a big opening into the tree. Lots of diseases, things can get in there. Probably a perfect habitat for some sort of animal that, that Dennis would love to see inhabit that tree. And, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, we'll hear about Squirrels. it. I Squirrels. I can see their chew marks around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, there could be the potential for some sort of, you know, disease in there. So that tree could be a danger in the future. So you want to think about having an arborist come out and look to see, does it need to come down? You know, what is the plan there? So there's nothing you can really do about the hole. All right, or should. All right, so then we have an Alda viewer. They've had this little tree for a couple years, no top on it. Should they go ahead and just prune the dead top off and put it in a better spot? or start over? Uh, you could give that a try. Um, you know, that top is not gonna come back. If you can get one of those top branches to turn into a new leader to go up, otherwise I would sort of try again. All right, and then we have a Council Bluffs, Iowa viewer for your last one. Uh, this is a six-year-old Tupelo, which is a nice tree. That she started it from seed. She has three little branches. She wants to know, should she prune two off now or just one this year and one next year? Uh, I would go ahead and prune those off because you definitely don't want multiple leaders there. You want one, you know, one trunk that will go up. Mm -hmm. So look for the best one or the one that's in the best place. So the one that's coming straight from the center or, you know, that's the best growth. You don't want any weird growth at the bottom.